Hey guys, welcome to section 3.2. In this section, we'll talk about slopes of straight lines. Let's get started. So the first thing we need to make sure we understand at a very basic fundamental level is that the slope of a straight line is nothing but the average rate of change. Uh, and the way we express this typically is it's the average rate of change of the output with respect to the input. What that means is that whatever change in output happens, that goes in the numerator. And because it's with respect to the input, whatever change in the input happens, that goes in the denominator. So the change in y can be represented a couple of different ways. We can have a delta y. Delta in science and mathematics in, in general is just known as a change. So change in y can be represented by delta y. Delta just means some change. Or another way of expressing the same thing is y2 minus y1. y2 meaning a second output minus a first output. A change in x can be represented similarly with delta x, meaning a change in x, or a second input minus a uh, first input. Now, slope is often represented by the letter m. Um, I was told a couple of years ago that it comes from montant, which is mountain or to rise in French. And Descartes, Rene Descartes was a French mathematician and logician who kind of gave us this entire framework of uh, analytical geometry that this basically predates. And given that he had French roots, we assume, or at least I think, that M came from Montan, or to keep climbing, or to rise. So M, which represents the slope, or the average rate of change, can be represented as a change in the output variable divided by a change in the input variable. So in other words, when the input variable changes by a certain amount, how much does the output variable change? Does it change a lot? Does it change only a little bit? What are the changes that are occurring? Now, change in y can also be represented as y2 minus y1. And change in x can also be represented as x2 minus x1. So this is probably the formula you're most familiar with from past courses. But again, because we're getting into an, uh, a more advanced understanding of slope, I wanted to make sure that you did not just learn it as this, that you understood that m, which is the slope, is an average rate of change of the output variable with respect to the input variable. So it's some delta y over some delta x, some delta of the output over some delta of the input. So here, a random example, just to see where the slope formula actually comes from. Let's say x-axis, y-axis, and we have some line. Now, for this particular x input, or for this input x1, the output is y1. So the coordinates of this point could be represented as x1 comma y1. Excuse me. For this second input x2, the output is y2. So the coordinates of this point could be represented as x2 comma y2. Now the change in y is the distance between y2 and y1, and we can find that by simply subtracting y1 from y2. So y2 minus y1 gives us this difference, or this change. Similarly, if we wanted to find out how much x changed, we could simply do x2 minus x1. So if this number is, say, I don't know, 10, and this number is 7, the distance between them, or the change, is 3. So. Now that's all fun and great. How is it that we can actually use this with numbers and how can we find slopes and average rates of change? So let's say that this first input is three, the second input is six. So hopefully you understand that the distance between these or the change in x is going to be three, six minus three. And let's say the output of the function when the input is three is seven. And then the output of the function when the input is six is 14. That means the distance between these two, or the change in y, or the delta y, is going to be 7. So what this means is, 
for every change on the x-axis by three units. So every time you go over to the right by three units, the output goes up by seven units. So now what we could do is say predict, which is what we really use mathematical functions for, is for their predictive value or for their predictive powers. If we were to say, okay, so if we start at six and go three forward, how much will the output change by? And the answer is seven again. Because this is a linear function, the rate of change does not change. The average rate of change does not change either. So again, the statement we can make is for every change on the x-axis by three units, for this change by three units, the output of the function changes by seven units. So what we can say is that the average rate of change is the change in y over the change in x. So seven over three is our average rate of change. Another way to express the same information is that the slope of this line is seven thirds. And then we can also use m to denote that that's the slope. So m turns out to be 7 thirds as well. So as you go forward, anytime you see find the average rate of change, the question is simply asking you to find the slope of the function. Or if someone says find m in this context, uh, we mean please find the slope. So next, what we can do is we can try to attach some meaning to these graphs. The problems become and remain fairly dry if they're just numbers and coordinates, and they don't represent anything meaningful to us. So let's say that this graph on the horizontal axis, instead of it just being x and the vertical axis just being y, if the vertical axis represents the weight of some animal, and the horizontal axis represents the age of the animal, so how old it is in months. So what we can say is that if we know that the weight growth or the growth rate of this animal is linear, meaning it follows a straight line, what we can say is that from month three to month six, the average rate uh, of change of the weight of this animal is going to be seven over three pounds per month. And the animal, because the number is positive, because the slope or the rate of change is positive, we can say that the animal is growing at a rate of seven thirds pounds per month. So there's two ways of representing this. So just finding slopes is relatively useless. When we start applying it to applications, that's when this idea of average rate of change or slope becomes meaningful. So before we can get to understanding and applying this stuff in a more meaningful way, we first need to understand it mechanically in terms of how is it that we find the slope or the average rate of change. So given any two points, we can always find the slope or the average rate of change by simply using this uh, formula that I'm sure you're very familiar with. So as an example, if the question says, find the slope or the average rate of change of a line through 2 comma 5 and 7 comma 12. So we have a line that passes through these two points and we need to find the slope or the average rate of change. Well, we can set this to be our first point. So this would be x1, this would be y1. We could set this to be our second point. This would be x2, this could be y2. And then plugging in the numbers is really quite simple. y2 minus y1 would give us seven over x2 minus x1 would give us five. So the slope of this particular line that passes through these two points is simply seven over five, and that's the same as the average rate of change. Now, there is no interpretation here because these numbers don't mean anything, but soon enough when we get into application problems, you'll be able to interpret what this number actually means. Now, this is in red because it's a very common mistake a lot of students make, so please, please, please make sure you commit this to memory. And uh, however you do that is not entirely up to you. So zero divided by any non-zero number is always zero. Zero over five, zero over negative five, zero over two thirds, zero over 7.6, zero over pi. All these numbers are non-zero numbers. All of them are equal to zero. So whenever you divide zero by a non-zero number, the answer is zero. Now the reason why it's non-zero is because zero divided by zero is an indeterminate form, which you get introduced to when you get to calculus, but for now, we're going to leave those questions out of the way. You're not going to be asked 
to consider things that look like 0 over 0. So 0 over a non-zero number, remember, is 0. Now what happens if the non-zero number is on top and you're dividing by 0? Well, that's undefined. It's an illegal operation in mathematics. We are not allowed to divide by 0. So if we flip all these fractions upside down and put all the numbers on top, the non-zero numbers on top and the zeros on the denominator, all of these are undefined. We have no idea what those are. Now, I mentioned that slide as a prelude to perhaps what you're about to see in the next couple of questions. So see how that kind of seemingly random set of ideas can be used to answer a couple of the questions that follow here. So in order to find the slope of a horizontal line, I want you guys to do a little investigation. So here's an example of a horizontal line. It passes through three points. Well, it actually passes through an infinite number of points, but the three points that I want you to pay attention to are A, B, and C. So the points are negative 4, 3, 3, 3, and 7, 3. So what do you think the slope of this line is? Now, you can use the slope formula to find it, uh, or you can make a conjecture and see if um, that works out to be the case or not. So I'm not going to tell you what the slope of a horizontal line is. You can find the slope of this line and then make a generalized conjecture and say, hey, I think that the slope of all horizontal lines will be this. So here are some questions that I want you to consider. Which coordinate does not change in this problem? It's a fairly easy question. I just want you to think about it. So looking at these points, which coordinate do you see does not change? Um, then I want you to find the slope of the line using the points A, B. So far, first find the slope of this line using these two points, then B, C. So then use this as point one and this as point two, and then finally A, C. So find the slope using A and C. Do you get the same answer? So once you've found the three answers for the slopes you, of A, B, B, C, and A, C, did you get the same answer or the same number for slope? And at this stage, what I want you to do is make a conjecture. A conjecture is an educated guess. You're saying that, you know, it's not just a random guess. I have reason to believe, and it's a pretty good reason to believe, that the slope of a horizontal line is blah, whatever blah happens to be. So I want you to make a conjecture about the slope of a horizontal line. And then take a look at question seven. So pause the video here. Take a look at question seven in your worksheet or the, the packet that you've been given and draw a graph for the two points listed in that question. Find the slope using those two points and then check to see if the answer to question seven supports your conjecture. So these questions I want you to write down on a separate sheet of paper and bring it to class to turn in. So there's this set of questions, there's four questions here, and then obviously do question seven in the packet itself, but I want you to write down the answers to these four questions in detail and then bring it to, with you to class. In this example, I want you to investigate the slope of a vertical line. So before we get started, here's a question to consider. What do you think the average rate of change of this line is? So there's three points, the x coordinate is seven, one of the points is A, 7, 6, B is 7, 1, and C is 7, negative 3. So here's a couple of questions just as before that I want you to consider. So which coordinate of those does not change? So of these three points on this line, and perhaps have any, any others that you might want to draw, are there any that do not change? And then the next thing I want you to do is find the slope of the line, of this vertical line, using the point A and the point B, then do the same calculations or computations with B and C, and then finally do the same thing with A and C as well. Do you get the same answer in all three computations? And then based on that, what I want you to do is make a conjecture or a guess or a hypothesis about what you think the slope of vertical lines is. Now this is not going to be a proof, this is just you saying I have a hunch and I think that this is the answer. 
I think the slope of vertical lines is blah, whatever blah happens to be. And then I want you to move on to question eight in the packet. But before you solve question eight, draw a graph of what the points represent in the problem. So once you've drawn the graph, the hint I'm going to give you is it should look something like this, not exactly the same, but it should look something like this, or it should resemble something like this. Now, once you've done that, whatever answer you get, does that support the conjecture you made here? So write down the answer to these four questions for the vertical lines, and also the four questions to the horizontal lines on two separate sheets of paper, uh, write your name on it, and then bring it to class with you, please. So here's an example of where we can actually start using this idea of slope and average rate of change to uh, for some use. So let's say that there's some imaginary populate, uh, there's some imaginary city with a population of 181,000 in 1980. In, 20 years later in 2000, the population is found to be 153,500. So maybe people moved away, maybe people passed away, maybe there was a disease, maybe there was a, a hurricane or some natural cause that led people to leave or flee. Uh, for some reason, the population went down. The question is, what is the average rate of change of population? And once you found it, what are the units on the rate? And then finally, interpret your results. So, great, we have the ability to find the answers, but we also more importantly need to know what we are finding and what the units are on the thing that we're finding. So first, I want you guys to recognize that the output is the population. Remember that the average rate of change is always of the output variable with respect to the input variable. So if we're asking you to find the average rate of change of population, population has to be the output variable. And because the other unit that's given to us or the other measurement that's given to us is time, is the number of years, that ends up being the input. So if population is the output, the only way we can figure that out is if we know what year we were talking about. So the change in population or the delta of the population is the final population, y2, minus the initial population, x, uh, y1. And this turns out to be negative 27,500 people. So the population declined over those 20 years by negative 27,500 people. The delta in the years, how much time passed between those two measurements, the final time or the final year, which is 2000 minus the initial year, X1 or T1, uh, if you want to call it that, would be 1980. And this time differential is 20 years, or that's the delta. So now we're on our way to find the average rate of change. The average rate of change of population will be the change in population over the change in time or change in the number of years. So we can divide the population change by the change in years, and we end up with negative 1375. So this answers the first question, what is the average rate of change of population? Next question was, what are the units on the rate? And we have to interpret our result as well. So the average rate of change of the population is negative 1375 people per year. I mean, you could say humans per year or people per year. Uh, it didn't define how the population was measured. So something that indicates that you're dividing population over time. Now, what that means is on average, the population of the town goes down because it's a negative number. It goes down by 1375 people per year. Now, the important word or the important phrase here is on average. This number may be 20,000 people left in the year 1980, and then only you know a small number of people left every year since then till 2000. So the 1,375 number is not a number that leaves every single year exactly. Some year, more people might leave. Some people, less people might, fewer people might leave. In, in some years, the population might actually go up. But the next year, a lot more people than went up might leave the town or might leave the city. And as a result, the net change or the average change over the years 
is on average, we can say, excuse me, 1,375 people were leaving uh, or the population was going down by that many people per year. Next, um, we get to a graphical depiction or a graphical understanding of slopes. So lines that have positive slopes are lines that lean to the right. And what I mean by that is if you were to copy, you're welcome to pause the video here and just copy this down. Now, what I want you to do is take your pencil and put it on top of any of these lines. So you can put a pencil here, put a pencil here, or put a pencil on any of these lines, but make sure that it's going straight up or down, up and down. It has to be a vertical uh, pencil. Now, when you start turning the pencil counterclockwise, so actually start rotating the pencil in this direction, and then do the same thing, make the pencil vertical and start rotating it clockwise. Which way do you get to coincide with the line faster? So when you turn to the left, the pencil has to turn a lot more before it coincides with the line. Versus if you turn to the right, the pencil doesn't have to turn as far. So we say that this line is leaning to the right because that's the shortest distance the pencil has to make to coincide with the line. The same thing will actually happen with this line as well. If you were to pick up, uh, put a pencil here, you'd have to turn it all the way here to make it coincide with the line versus you would have to turn it only this much to coincide with the line this way. So lines that have positive slopes lean to the right or lines that lean to the right have positive slopes. The same is true of lines with negative slope or the opposite is true, I'm sorry, I take that back. The opposite is true or the same idea applies to lines that lean to the left. So again, if you were to take your pencil and put it on this line, it's shorter to make it turn counterclockwise or to the left to coincide with the line. The same thing is true of this line, of this line, of all these lines. If you turn the pencil to the left or you lean the pencil to the left, you will coincide with the line that we have faster. So that's why we say that these lines have negative slope because they lean to the left. Now, this is probably the most common mistake students make with graphs of lines and finding their slopes. The slope of a straight line does not depend on its location, meaning it doesn't matter whether the line itself is in quadrant three. It doesn't matter if the line itself is in quadrant one or quadrant four or quadrant two. It, the location of the line has no bearing on the slope of the line. So it doesn't matter if the line itself has negative y values. It doesn't matter if the line itself has positive y values. That has no bearing on the slope whatsoever. The only thing that we care about when we measure slope is which way it's leaning. So if the line leans to the right, like all of these do, they have positive slope. It doesn't matter where physically on the graph the line is. So all these lines lean to the left, therefore the slopes are all negative. It has no bearing on whether the line itself is above the x-axis or below the x-axis. Both of these lines have negative slope because they are leaning to the left. So again, just to summarize, the slope of a line that leans to the right is positive. The slope of a line that leans to the left is negative. So this line has a positive slope. This line has a negative slope, just to drive this point home. Finally, well, it's great to understand that lines that lean to the right have positive slopes, but what are their slopes relative to each other? So a line that goes right through and makes about a 45 degree angle through, say, the origin. So this line that goes right through the origin and it cuts the first quadrant and the third quadrant in half, the slope of this line is one. What that means is for every change in the input variable by one unit, the output only changes by one unit as well. And then when you change one more unit to the right, the output only goes up by one unit. So every x you go to the right by one, the y only changes by one as well. Now any lines that are lower or less steep than the line uh, than this line that has slope one, the slope will be less than one. So this will be 
uh, as I'm just making these numbers up, but the slope of this line is probably one third. And what that means is this line has to go out three units on the x axis for it to only go up one on the y axis. So it's a very gentle slope, you have to walk a lot more to the right hand side for it to climb up a little bit. By contrast, a line that's steeper than uh, the slope then the line with slope m equals one, the number is higher. So what this means is you can imagine four being the same as four over one. That means that for every one unit we move to the right on the x axis, the function moves up by four units. And then when you move one more to the right, the function moves up by four units. So the rate of change here is a lot higher. This means that for every change in input by one unit, the output is changing by four. So m equals one is the line that's 45 degrees. If the angle is lower, the number is less than one. If the angle is higher, the number is higher than one. The same thing, or the similar argument can be used for lines with negative slopes as well. So relative to each other, the slope of this line that goes exactly 45 degrees to the left hand side goes right through here is negative one. This means for every change in x on the negative side, your function goes up by one unit. And then you go again to the left by one, and you go up by one, left by one, up by one. So the rate of change here does not change. It's always negative one. Now if you're less steep than that line, the slope of this line could roughly be about negative one third. Again, the scale is not given because the rough idea is what I'm trying to get across, not exact numbers. What this means is that for every three units you go to the left on the x-axis, you only go up by one. So then you go again three units to the left, and then you go up by one. Three units again to the left, and you go up by one. Vice versa, if we were to think about m equals negative three, that means for every one unit you go to the left, the function goes up by three units. Every one unit you go to the left, the function goes up by three units. So this is a lot steeper of a line. And I believe that's it. If you guys have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out. We're available through Slack and by email, office hours, anything that you guys need help with, please reach out. Have a nice day.